Rub up your engines! Well, here's an odd one. If you had owned a Volkswagen in the past, you may be eligible for up to $5,350 back from Volkswagen. It sounds weird, but it's true. And this has nothing to do with that diesel gate stuff. This is that in the year 2021, consumers put a class action suit against Volkswagen. Over 3.3 million people who had bought Audis, Volkswagen owns Audi, over a data breach. They let their information get out. They say the data breach gave all the information out of owners from 2014 to 2019. Now, both Volkswagen and Audi admit no wrongdoing, but they agreed to pay people off. As usual, this is legalese. We didn't do anything wrong, but we're going to pay people out. So here's how complex, you know, Volkswagen, they really don't want to give the money back. So they're making it very complex. But if you owned a Volkswagen and an Audi, then you might check into it. You know, this is how insane it is, though. And I quote, under the terms of the settlement, members of the California SPI subclass can receive payments of $350. Members of the PI subclass can receive payments of $20. And California SPI members may grab up to $5,350. I mean, the legalese involved in this stuff is insane. <laughs> But if you did own a Volkswagen and Audi during those years, you might check into it. And you might get some money out of them from the settlement. And of course, I mean, you're probably going to have to hire a lawyer for it too, going by all the technicality they have. And when you see the small amount that most claims are going to be, 350 80 or 20 bucks, who the heck is going to go through all that hassle? And you know, most people aren't going to, which is why a lot of these settlements are total BS. You'd pay more money on a lawyer looking into it than you're ever going to get back. But you never know. If you want to get even with Volkswagen and Audi, you might look into it. Just take my advice. Don't buy one in the first place. They're endless money pits, and they're not very well made anymore. Bob GP says, I have hard starting when it's below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I got a 2002 Saab, 90,000 miles. When it's above 50, no problem. When it's below, I got a crank, 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 crank. Within the past year, I put in a fuel pump, fuel filter, battery, spark plugs. It still does that. Help. It's an old Saab. One of the reasons Saab left the United States was because nobody could fix the cars. Parts are expensive. The company's now bankrupt. They don't sell any cars, make cars. So it wasn't that great of a company to begin with. But you're saying it's fine till it gets below 50. You got some kind of a problem in either sensors or computer modules. Because if it was a physical problem, a fuel injector was leaking, the temperature is going to have no effect. It's still going to be leaking at 55 or 45, right? But computers and electronics, you got a loose wire, bad connection, corrosion on the wiring. Realize all those systems work on a five volt reference, all the computer systems of the car. And that is not much power. Any little corrosion will knock those things out. You're going to have to try to find a good Saab mechanic who really knows and has the Saab equipment to hook it up to analyze all the ignition and fuel system to see what the heck is going on with it. It could be as simple as a little corrosion. If you want to take all the wiring apart, especially the computer wiring, get all those wiring unbolt the connector, pull them off, look at all the wires, see if there's any green corrosion. Could be it's just a corroded terminal, which will do exactly that. Pray it's that easy, but if not, you're going to need a top-notch Saab mechanic, if you can even find one in the United States, and hope they can get their scan tool and find out, well, this module's bad and replace a module. They got a lot of modules on it. Jason, though, 6 says, should I buy a non-running Fusion? It's an 07 Ford Fusion with 204,000 miles. It needs brake pads, tires, and a water pump. Now, I had the same 06 model for one year, and it had 246,000 miles and it ran fine. All right. My advice, never, ever buy a non-running car unless you're a mechanic and you're getting it dirt cheap. Look, it's a Ford Fusion, 204,000 miles. It's nearing the end of its lifespan. It doesn't even run. I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Guys always tell people, oh, it just needs this. Don't worry. Well, if it just needs that, let them do it and then see if it runs and buy it. Never, ever buy one that doesn't run. I see people all the time, they'll say, well, we put a new engine in it, but you know, uh, now it needs this and it's not running. Who knows if the engine came from a junkyard, if it's good, if they actually put one in. Who knows? Don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Never buy a vehicle that doesn't run. It's a big mistake. Brennan Gilbert says, Morning, Scotty. Can you explain how to clean an electronic throttle body? I heard the process is different than a manual one. I have a 2017 Lexus LS 10,000 miles. Okay. You don't put many miles on your car. You got 10,000 miles. The car's six years old. Eh? It'll last you probably the rest of your life. You know? The old ones are easy because you would just grab the throttle cable, pull on it, open it a little, spray, clean it, wipe it, get some clean cloths, get all the corrosion off. Well, of course, you can't do that because 
because it's an electric motor. So what you do in that case is get yourself like a little piece of rubber hose and push the throttle open. Leave it open with the car turned off and everything. Spray the cleaner, let it soak a little, wipe all the parts because you want to get the edge of the throttle plate clean and it won't really get clean if it's shut. You open it like that a little, let it air dry for half an hour, put your finger in there, take the rubber hose out, no damage done. The rubber isn't going to hurt anything. You don't want to use metal, you might scratch it or something, but the rubber keeps from scratching and make sure you use spray throttle cleaner. It's special stuff. You can buy it at any auto parts store and it'll do a good job and it'll let it dry about half an hour before you put it back together and start the car up. AJ says I got a 95 GMC CR 1500 been sitting for five years. Slight rust. Is it worth fixing? Well, I'll tell you what. I am not a fan of the 1500s. The new ones. By new, I mean like 2007, 8 on to the present, right? Those 95s are pretty strongly built. If it isn't the frame rotting away and it's going to fall off, which isn't worth fixing, they are worth fixing other than that. They can run forever. Those old V8s were well made in 95. I had customers with them that are still driving those things. I would, but if the frame's rot and you hit it with a hammer and it crunches, pieces fall off, then it's not worth it because it's just going to rot away. But as long as the frame's still solid, you get superficial rust, fender rust and stuff, I can live with that. Mustang Marvin says, Scott, are you coming back to Rhode Island? Yeah, I'll be back there uh, April, May, June. So people contact me April, May, June. They want to see me in Rhode Island. I'll check out your cars. You can visit with me. And I'm glad I'm not there now because I just checked. And it's three degrees there. I'm in Tennessee now. It's 49 degrees here, but it's three degrees there. So I'll take 49 versus three. And the other day, it was in the 70s here in Tennessee. I went out swimming. Yes, I will be back in the spring. Keep them classic 67, says Scotty. I got a 97 Honda Accord with a brake fluid leak. It leaks the whole canister in a day or two. Any tips? All right. Well, find where the leak is. First thing, take the wheels off, look inside, see if it's wheel cylinders, see if it's the brake caliper, see if the hose is leaking. Look for obvious leaks. It'll be dripping all over the place, right? If you don't see any on that, then it's your brake master cylinder. Because when it leaks, it'll leak inside the brake booster, which you can't see. It's a sealed unit. So when you take the brake master cylinder off, you look inside the booster, you'll probably see it's full of fluid. Now, you might have to buy a new booster too. It can cost a fortune, but you can try getting a suction device by sticking a tube inside the booster once you take the master off, suck all the fluid out, and it might be reusable because that's where it's going to go if you don't see it leaking anywhere. But check for leaks first, of course. Ortiz Boneyard says, Scotty, what's the best way to learn to rebuild engines? Yeah, go in the past when they were simpler. <laughs> Back in the day, engines were a lot simpler. They had one cam, push rod engines, very simple stuff. Now, four valves per cylinder, variable valve timing. And the problem is, it costs so much to rebuild an engine correctly that most people never do anymore. They don't rebuild them. They just junk them, get another car. They try a used engine with lower mileage from a junkyard. To totally rebuild a modern car, variable valve timing, to do it correctly, most, most, you're going to spend four to six thousand dollars. Most people don't want to spend that kind of money. So if you're going for old classic cars, yeah, you know, you can watch a lot of videos. There's courses you can take at places if you want. There's places that have engine rebuilding summit and things, but the modern ones are so complex, you probably find out it isn't worth the money to rebuild them correctly because they're so complex and you need so many specialty tools to do with it. Hamptons Fronts 201 says, good morning, Scotty. Should I get a used Honda CRV 2.4 or Lexus RX 350? Well, you're talking about apples and oranges here. The CRV is a very good vehicle. The 2.4 is an excellent engine and the Lexus 350 are excellent vehicles. The Lexus is a luxury vehicle. The Honda is more an economical vehicle. What do you want? Do you want to get better gas mileage, have a lot rougher ride, or do you want to get a little bit worse gas mileage and have a really smooth riding car? Plus, how much money are you planning on spending, you know? <laughs> if you're buying new, the Lexus costs so, so much more money. Now, if you could find a good used Lexus like I did for my wife, go ahead and buy it. But always keep price versus quality in mind. You know, if you're talking new, hey, I'd get the CRV because the Lexus has cost so much more. Mr. Bird says, 2014 Ford Focus is an alignment required when you change the struts. Not if you do it correctly. If you buy the correct parts, all you're doing is disassembling parts of the front end. You take the parts off, you put the new strut in, you put the parts back on again. You have to take the outer tie rod assembly off, but you take the bolt off, you get a tie rod pusher, it pushes it out, goes to the side. You're not on 
unscrewing the tie rod and screwing it back in, which would need a readjustment, you're just putting it right back. So if you buy quality parts, now let's say you buy some cheap Chinese strut assembly, it may be the wrong size and it won't sit right. You would have to get it readjusted. But if you bought a high quality OEM replacement, no, you wouldn't have to do an alignment. I know a lot of guys are trying, well, we did your struts. Now you got to pay us a hundred something dollars for an alignment. A lot of times it isn't needed. If good parts were used, it doesn't need readjusting. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.